Most rocketeers seem satisfied with just being told how high their rocket flew. And that's a shame. How did the rocket get to that point? That is what you should really be concerned about. The story of your rocket's flight is just not a peak altitude number. The real story is the trajectory path that your rocket takes during the flight. Does it go straight up or does it arc over? Does it spin as it ascends? What happens once the recovery system is deployed? Where does the rocket go? How far away does it land? Will it touch down in a location where you can easily recover it? These are the answers that you, you can get using the Launch Visualizer. It is an app on the Roxim website and you can test it out right now for free finally you have a way to simulate your rockets that gives you the true information that you need to be successful and the best part is that you don't have to walk after your rocket after it comes back down to the ground It's the fun. Test your rockets at rocksim.com. Most rocketeers seem satisfied with just being told how high their rocket flew. And that's a shame. How did the rocket get to that point? That is what you should really really be concerned about. The story of your rocket's flight is just not a peak altitude number. The story is the trajectory path that your rocket takes during the flight. Does it go straight up or does it arc over? Does it spin as it ascends? What happens once the recovery system is deployed, where does the rocket go? How far away does it land? Will it touch down in a location where you can easily re recover it? are the answers that you can get using the Launch Visualizer. It is an app on the Roxim.com website and you can test it out right now for free. Finally, you have a way to simulate your rockets that gives you the true information that you need to be successful. And the best part is that you don't have to walk after your rocket after it comes back down to the ground. Experience the fun. Your rockets right now .com. Most rocketeers seem satisfied with just being told how high their rocket flew. And that's a shame. How did the rocket get to that point? That is what you should really be concerned about of your rocket's flight is just not a peak number. The real story is the trajectory path that your rocket takes during the flight. Does it go straight up or does it arc over? Does it spin as it ascends? What happens once the recovery system is deployed? And we're live! <laughs> I do that every time. <laughs> 
Welcome to another edition of Roxham Live. My name is Tim Van Milligan, and this is where we talk about the Roxham software. Um, so if you are just joining us, I do have the chat going on because we are live. Um, so go ahead and say hello and where you're from so that I can recognize you and also um, put in your rock sim questions because I don't have any questions to answer this week. So I am depending on you to give me a topic to talk about. Um, okay, so I'm looking over on my chat over here on my second monitor and we have Carlos from Ariana, Georgia. And we ha he has the first question. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, let's see, what is going on? Um, I was playing around with the um, pre-roll. Um, I give a five minute head start um, before we actually go live. Um, and I found that I could play videos while that's going on. So now I have to think about what kind of video do we want playing before we start the Roxim Live. So. What do you want to hear about? Do you want to see uh, product reviews? Do you want to learn about Apogee? Do you want to learn about the launch visualizer? Um, so I am open to suggestions now that I have discovered that we can play with videos before we go live. <laughs> so cool, so cool. Um, let me show you my screen. Okay, so here's my screen. Um, I have rocks I'm running right now. Um, I also have our web browser right here. So let me show you where we are located. Um, if you have never heard of Roxon before, you get it at apogeerockets.com. That's our website. Uh, we're doing the Roxon Live training, which is this little picture right here. So if you click on that, that takes you to our archives. Um, if you'd like to uh, learn about Roxon, click on the banner that says Roxon. Um, you can also get there by going to the menus right up here at the top of the screen. Click on that, come down to software, and here is where you can learn about Roxim. We have a free trial that you can download. Here's the link to purchase it. Um, if you want to know, you know, in general terms, what is Roxim, here's that. Um, here's a list of features frequently asked questions that we get all the time. Um, the system requirements are right here and the version history that we're on. Uh, we also have other tutorials here, the video tutorials, um, Roxim Live Training, which is what we're doing right now. Um, and then there's other stuff down here that you can read about. So um, if you click on Roxim Live Training, we are on episode number 89 today. It is September 30th, 2022 today. Um, this is what we talked about last week, editing motors into the database. Um, and so if you go to the YouTube video link right here and you go to 27 minutes and 30 seconds into the video, that's where we started talking about that particular topic. And then you'd find other topics here on the web page as well. There's, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, if you want to learn something really quick and you don't know where it is and you don't want to read through everything, just do a search. And to do a search is pretty easy. Just on your keyboard, do a control F or on the Macintosh, it's command F. And what happens is um, it, brings up a little tiny search bar in the top, but it only searches this particular page. So um, you might want to know about troubleshooting. So you can type in the word troubleshooting and you'll see that it, we talked about it 11 times. And the, first, the last time we talked about it was episode 85. And then you can just click through these little buttons and you can see what type of troubleshooting we are talking about. You can do that with any phrase you want. Just do a quick search, find it really fast. Um, and that's how I recommend that you find stuff. So, Terry says, 
let's build a rocket. <laughs> Roxim is the bomb. Thank you, Terry. Um, and we have George Hyman. He says, hello. Awesome. George, where are you from? I don't know where you're from. You're a, a brand new name that I've, I've not seen before in our Roxim Live. I had to get a sip, sip of water there. Um, okay, so the first question came from Carlos in Marietta, Georgia, and he wondered, he says, do you have any favorite resources where we can learn more about the Barrowman equations? And I do have a favorite resource. Um, it's here on the Apogee website. Um, if you go to How To and Guides right here, um, and then come down here to Rocketry, How To and Technical Information, that link right there, click on that. Um, and then we want to look for R&D projects from the NAR. I think it's in here. It's either there or in Rocket Stability. I'll check here first. Um, so that takes us to a list of reports from the um, that were created either by myself or other people in the NAR. And I am going to do a find on this page to search. So again, it's going to pop up right here. I'm going to type in Barrowman. And sure enough, there it is. One of six matches. And the first one is Barrowman Original R&D Report. So Barrowman in 1965, I think it was, wrote a report for Narum 8, 1966. And this is the original Barrowman report from 1966. This was before computers, or at least personal computers, uh, before electronic calculators. Um, and so back then we were using slide rules to do detailed heavy duty math. Well, I wasn't because in 1966 I was only about a year old. Um, so let me make this a little bit smaller and you can see that this is an original scan. We, we talked to Jim Barrowman. He's still around. He's still flying rockets. Um, he's in uh, Virginia, uh, but he wrote this report and if you get to seeing it, you'll see it has a lot of equations. You see the symbols. Um, and so doing the this math is pretty involved. And so what Barrowman, what Jim Barrowman did was he simplified all the equations by simplifying the rocket. So instead of making really complex rockets, he narrowed it down in focus to rockets that are generally long and slender and have fins at the back. Um, and so if the rocket is that kind of configuration, there are some simple equations you can do just using algebra. And not even calculus, just plain old algebra. So he simplified the math so you could do it on a slide rule. But later on, we started using calculators. And then later on after that, in the late 1980s, we started using personal computers to do it. We had started having programs. And people put the Barrowman equations into spreadsheets and simple programs. I remember there was a, um, on, on the Macintosh, they used to have something called a stack. And you could create little programs for it. And Tom Beach created one for the Barrowman equations. And it was just so cool. Um, but then when Windows came around, there was no Windows software. Um, so there was... Um, there was a program called VCP, which was, I think, called Variable CP, which was basically the Barrowman equations. And it was, it was like a text document. And so the, it had a number of questions. It's like, uh, what shape is your nose cone? And it would give you choices, A, B, C, or D. You know, conical, ogive, elliptical. And you'd pick one. And then you'd tell it the length and the diameter. 
and then you do that for the body tube and then over time you could get the center of pressure for your rocket. Well, in uh, around 1996 or 1995, um, he wasn't my friend at the time, but he became a really great friend um, named Paul Fossey. He was a programmer. And he was living in uh, the Massachusetts area. And he approached me and he said, Tim, um, you wrote the book Model Rocket Design and Construction. I'd like to take that and turn it into a computer program so people could design rockets. And I said to him, well, sure, go ahead. What do I have to lose? Uh, but what he came back with blew my mind. It was a, it was the beginning of Roxim, and it was all graphical, basically like what you see now, but it was, it was simpler, but it just blew me away. You could just, you know, um, you select the nose cone shape, and you could just drag sliders along, which we'll show you here in a minute, um, and you could just create a rocket on the fly, and it did it really quick in graphical interface and then he, later we added a 3d version um, and now we have the launch visualizer so it keeps growing and growing and so but it all started out with the Barrowman equations um, but what we did was um, Jim Barrowman as you'll read in here he made a lot of simplifying assumptions and he says you know okay so here's the equation use this equation but we're gonna simplify it and so what we want to do is use this equation because it's a lot easier to do. Well, we went back to this original report and we found all those simplifications. And since modern computers don't really care how hard the math is, it'll just do it. Uh, we pulled all those out. And so what we have now is what we call the ROXIM stability method. Um, and you can see that if you're in Roxim, if you go to the rocket design attributes, and you can see where it says CP, show CP location. Um, if you click on that, you have a drop down, and you have three choices. You have the Roxim stability equations, the Barrowman stability equations, or the cardboard cutout method. Because prior to 1966, we used to use the cardboard cutout method to find the center, center of pressure location. It was an estimate and it was really conservative. It would put the center of pressure a lot further forward on the rocket than it really was. And that made the rocket unstable. And then in order to make the rocket stable, you'd have to put in more nose weight. So you start with a stable rocket and you put more nose weight in it and it comes really stable. You really don't need that much nose weight. And that's why we call it being overly conservative. The further back the center of pressure is, um, the more realistic it is, uh, but you have to calculate it. You can't, if it's too far back, then it's unrealistic. And you see that here in the 3D or the 2D side view. Um, this little symbol right here is the center of gravity and this is the center of pressure and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about calculating where that is on the rocket. And if I change that to the Barrowman stability method, so watch that red dot when I switch it to the Barrowman stability equations, it shifts forward. So because of the simplifications, it made it more conservative. When you pull those simplifications out, now you have the Roxim method and you can see it goes further back. Um, and if you use the cardboard cutout method, you can see it jumps really far forward. And so now the rocket with the cardboard cutout method is unstable because the center pressure is ahead of the center of gravity. So to make that rocket fly stable, you end up putting, you have to move the center of gravity forward. So you put nose weight in that moves this in front of it and now the rocket flies, but in real life, the center of pressure is back there. And so now you got an overweight, you know, center of gravity really far forward rocket when it really doesn't need to be that. You know, it would go a lot higher and faster if you could pull all that nose weight out. And so that's why 
I recommend using the Roxham stability equations. We did this 20 years ago. Um, and in the 20 years since we made the assumptions, everybody that has used the Roxham stability equations, nobody has ever said that Roxham told them that their rocket was stable and when they actually flew it, it went unstable. So that tells us that this method is okay based on historical evidence. Um, so I'm going to continue recommending that you just leave it in the Roxham stability equations right there. So that answers Carlos's question of where do you find the Berman stability equations. Um, you're not, you, I did this for maybe one or two rockets. I, I went through all the calculations to confirm that they work. And it's a lot of work. Um, you go into Roxham, you know, and you can just move things around. So like I, I can take this fin set right here. So this fin set right here, and I can just change the location. And look, the, the center of pressure is moving on the fly. So as I'm moving it, it's calculating a new CP every time, just as fast as I can move it. So why would I go through the equations to calculate this new location when I can just let the software do it for me? <laughs> That's why we have the software. Um, you can see, see how it's doing it right there. So great question, Carlos. Oh, let me get another drink. We have Rick DeFosses from New Hampshire. I got to brag on Rick. Um, we did a newsletter this past week at the Apogee website. So if you go to the home page, come on, this is not the home page. Go to the home page, apogeerockets.com. And you scroll down and you go to the latest newsletter, issue number 583, um, and you click on that, and this article was written by Rick DeFosses, who is in the house right now, and he wrote an article on all the permutations you could use, motor permutations and combinations you could use if you're flying clusters. and. And it was pretty cool. Um, like, if you had, I want to get to one of his results. If you had um, 24, uh, a motor mount with 24 millimeter motors, and there are two, uh, just two motors in the cluster. So the rocket, you know, if you looked at the back end of the rocket, there are two motor mounts. Currently, there are 69 24 millimeter motors. Um, so, there are a possible number of 4,761 com combinations of different motors that you can use. Um, but if the order does not matter, you can knock it down to 2,415. If you have repeats, like the same motor, like um, a D12 and a D12 versus not using the same motors, if, you, if you're not allowed to have repeats, then you could have 2,346 possible combinations. If you had a four engine cluster of 25, 29, 24 millimeter diameter motors, like a, the D12 size, there are over 1,028,000 1,790 possible combinations where you can have repeats and if you eliminate any repeats so you can only use one, each motor one time, um, there are 864,501 possible combinations. So imagine the number you would get if you had a seven motor cluster like the Lock Ultimate. <laughs> Uh, you're probably 
in the hundreds of thousands, if not in the billions of possible combinations. Um, yeah, so that is how you would find out the number of possible combinations you could possibly use in your rocket if you're flying a cluster. Um, so Rick wrote that article, and I thank Rick. Thank you, Rick. It was a great article. Ah, so what's, what else is going on here? Um, we have Art Applewhite from Texas. Chris Swainston from Golden Valley, Arizona is in the house. Um, <laughs> Terry Wheelock says, all you need to know is the number of barrel rolls you can do based on what you had for lunch. I'm not sure what he's talking about, but that's cool. Terry, but Terry wanted to design a rocket, and I have no other question. So if you don't have a question, we're going to design a rocket. Um, so to design a rocket, you go into Roxham, and we're going to hit cancel. We don't want to save any changes. We're going to start off with a brand new rocket. So to start off with a new rocket, go up here to the top corner with the uh, new um, document and it's going to ask us do we want to save the old one we're going to say no we don't want to save it so you start out with a blank sheet of paper um, and when you design a rocket what we're going to do is we're going to work along these tabs here at the top so we're going to start out with the rocket design attributes and you're going to give it a name so we'll call this september 30th 2022 rocket since that's today's date. <laughs> um, we'll make it a single stage rocket. The static margin will be, be based on the nose cone diameter. And we'll just leave everything else alone because it's, it's already pre-populated. Pre so then we're going to go over to the next tab and this is where we're going to start adding components. So remember we said it's going to be a single stage rocket and a single stage rocket is the uppermost stage of a rocket and it's, it's called the sustainer. That's what we call it. And we're going to start adding parts to this. So we're going to get into a list of parts. So we're going to come over here to where we can add parts. And we can add any of these three parts here or a subassembly. Subassemblies we're not going to do. Typically, we start from the top of the rocket and we work downwards. So let's do a nose cone. Like we could design something like this. Um, so first we got to know in general what size this is and it's going to be based on the tube diameter. Um, this rocket that I have here in my hand, this is a BT-60. So I am looking for something that says BT-60. So here's a T-60, so I'm pretty sure that'll probably be okay. So I click OK on that and it draws a nose cone right here. Um, and then it tells us what the shape is, and this one's parabolic. Um, and it has a length of 3.248 inches, and that's measured from here to here. Plus it has a shoulder on the back, but that's not included in the length. Um, so if I make it zero, we can tell that's zero. And if we stretch it, we can make it anything we want right now. I got it at 2.875 inches. Um, it's made out of balsa wood and it's solid. So that means it doesn't have any holes in it in the base. And we can change the color here. And I like to change colors. That way I can tell things apart. So the 2D color is going to be this kind of cream colored gray. And the 3D color will make it orange. Um, so I can see it in 3D. So over here I got different views. I'm on this screen right now, so I'm going to cover that up. Um, I can come down here and select 3D. You can see I have my orange nose cone, and I can click and drag it around. Okay, so that's my nose cone. And if you like your nose cone, you can just say OK. So now we have a nose cone. Um, next, we're going to add a tube. So you got to highlight the part up here that you're going to add to it. So now you can see there's more buttons available, but we're going to choose a body tube. 
and I know this is a BT60, so I'm looking for in the description something that has 60 in it. Uh, or, like, um, oh, here's a Estes BT60. And I click OK. And it added a tube to my nose cone, as you can see. I can spin it around. Um, currently, it's blue. We can change that. Um, we can change the length. Let me go back to 2D. Okay, so remember, as we said earlier, Roxim is calculating the center pressure and the center of gravity. Um, why is the center pressure so far forward? Um, that's because the body tube, according to the Barrowman equations that you'll read about, um, it doesn't contribute to anything to the forces on the rocket. That's what it calculates. In real life, it does, but in the equations, it doesn't. Um, so we'll assume that's correct, but it will calculate the center of gravity, and that's where the center of gravity is right here. So I can change the length, and as I change the length, the center of gravity is moving forward. So we'll make it about that long. Um, and we'll change the color. So the color, I think I made it orange nose cone. I usually, when I make a nose cone and a body tube the same color, I'll tweak one of them just a little bit so there's a, diff a little shading difference in color so I can tell where the nose cone stops and the body tube starts. That's kind of one of my little tricks. So I just, I usually just take this little gray slot, you know, the, the darkness slider and I just make it just a smidge darker and click OK. And you can see what I mean when I, when I show it in 3D. So um, if I rotate it around, you can see that the tube is just a shade darker. So I can tell it where the nose cone ends and the tube starts. And then you can also get the, uh, the reflection of the light on the tube, so you can kind of tell where it is. OK, so I'm going to click OK. And now we can add um, we can add internal components or we can add fins. So let's add the fins first. So I'm going to click on the body tube. And then I, I have a choice of fins. I can do regular fins, custom fins, ring tails, or tube fins. So I have four choices. Um, a regular fin is either going to be a trapezoid or an elliptical shape. Um, custom fin shape could be anything that's flat and like has a curved edge on the front. So you could do a trapezoid or an ellipse, but you can do um, shark fins. Uh, um, you can do things that look like this. This would be a custom fin because this is not a trapezoid because a trapezoid only has four sides. This has one, two, three, four, and then the root edge is five. So even though this almost looks like it's parallel to the tube, because we have this flat edge at the base, it's not a trapezoid. Come on, you know your geometry. <laughs> um, so that would be a custom fin. A ring tail is a tube that goes completely around the rocket. That's called a ring tail, and a tube fin is small tubes that are glued to the side of the rocket. Those could be added as fins as well. They produce forces, which will allow the rocket to fly straight. Uh, we'll do a custom fin. So lots of people like to use custom fins. Um, when you create any new part, it always looks in the database first. So that's why it brought up the database of parts. I'm going to cancel out of that. And you can see our rocket. Um, it put a generic fin here on the rocket. Um, that's just a starting point, so you kind of, you know, visualize it in your head. Um, but I'm going to, um, so you can select the number of fins. So this has three. I think I'll leave it three. And the location is 8.59 inches from the front of the owning part. And see, this is the location from the front of the owning part. The owning part, we said, was the tube. So from the front of the tube to where the fins are is 8.59 inches. But I want to change this from the base of the owning part. And when I do that, it changes to zero. So now the fins are referenced from the back of the tube to the back of the fin. 
And I do this for a reason, because if I make my tube longer, the fins will automatically track with the tube. So if they're attached at the base of the, the tube, if I make the tube longer, they'll still be on the base of the tube. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to go to the plan points. And right here shows us, there's this, uh, this little bar right here. You, you can't see it, but there's a little dot right there. If you move your cursor up and down, and if you uh, get right over the dot, you can grab it and you can adjust the size of the screen. Of course, my screen doesn't want to adjust right now. See, so yeah, I can adjust it and I can make this grid over here larger. And I can also do the same here on this side because um, now we can adjust these points. And if I zoom in just a little bit here, um, you can see as I, I click and drag, oops. Oops, let me click and drag. You have to kind of click twice. Now I highlight it and I can drag it. You can see, you know, as I'm dragging around, I'm changing the shape of my fin. And if I want to make this a round edge, I can use this chamfer button right here. And it says the chamfer radius, so how much of a curvature I want. Um, I'll make it um, 0.75 inches. And then I'll add eight points. So what it's going to do is it's going to put eight points along here as soon as I click OK. You can see it did put the eight points there. And you can see in my 3D that it changed the curvature of that fin. I think we need to curve that one here, too. So let's do the same thing, see what happens. Eh, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> But it's a fin. And then all these over here are the actual grid coordinates of that point. So if you click on that, you can see what point I'm highlighting right there. Um, let's go back to the general tab. I need to select the material right now. It's nothing. Um, so that's bad. So we need to select a material. So we'll call this balsa wood. And it, we already have a thickness. You can adjust the thickness if you'd like. And the cross section, I'm going to make it rounded. So I'm just literally rounding off both the leading and the trailing edges. So that's this edge here and that edge there. And what that does is it affects the coefficient of drag of the rocket. It makes the rocket fly a little bit higher. Um, let's also change the color because I like doing that. Um, let's make it a darker orange, and in 2D, I'll make it that dark purplish color, and click OK. Okay, so now we're seeing our rocket. It's got fins on it. Um, now we need to add all the internal components. Let's start with the motor mount. So where do you add the motor mount? You need to select this tube. Here in the 2D side view, you can just click on it, and it will select that tube up here in the parts tree. And then I can add the internal parts. So I want to add an inside tube as my engine mount, because it's inside the body tube. So I'm going to click on that, and then I need to select a tube. And I know this, I'm going to, well, I don't know, but let's make it 18 millimeter and click OK, and you can see we got a tube hanging out the back. Let's look at it in 2D. The tube starts here, and then it's really long. It's 18 inches long, and that's like too long, so we're going to make that a lot shorter. I'm going to make it 2.75 inches, which is your typical length of the engine mount that you'd get in most rocket kits. And again, I'm going to select the location from the base of the part. And so right now it's measured 9.125 inches from the base to here. And I'm going to slide it to the bottom. When it gets to zero, they're flush with the back of the rocket. That's OK. Um, I need to check this box. This is what tells Roxim that this is where the motor is going to go. And as soon as I check it, it changes. And now it allows me, I can load an engine if I want to. And why would you want to load an engine? 
because you want to see where that center of gravity is at launch because we have to make sure that the center of gravity doesn't go behind the center of pressure. Um, and this, the motor, because it's heavy, is going to move that center of gravity. So I will load an engine. And when you load an engine, what you want to do is to load the biggest engine that you'll ever think you'll fly in this kit. Um, and these are all, you know, pretty much the same size. Um, I think I'll go with an Estes C6, and we'll make it a C65. And it's going to um, overhang the back of the tube by 0.5 inches. So what that means is the back of the tube, it's going to hang out behind the rocket 0.5 inches. So when I click OK, you'll see the rocket got loaded here. And to zoom in on here, I'm just using my scroll wheel on my mouse. There's also magnifying buttons up here. Um, and there's also, if you right click on the 2D drawing, you'll get a contextual menu where you can adjust zoom in. Um, you can also zoom original, um, which is the original size. So I'm just zooming in. So here's the end of the tube right here. And then my motor sticks out the back one half inch. So that's OK. The center of gravity did move back. I think it before it was somewhere around here with the motor, it moved back here. So we're still stable. And you can see that right here. As long as the margin is a positive number, we're stable. So that's OK. I'm going to change the color. I'm going to make it orange again. And in 2D, I don't know, make it blue. All right, and this back here on the general tab, it's just called body tube. And I like to change the, the names of these things to make it easier to find them in the parts tree. So we're going to call it the engine mount tube and click OK. And you see now it shows the engine mount tube back here. Um, now, let me just double check my things here. We have ESPN. Eight from Minnesota checking in. You just received the Nuke Pro Max from you yesterday, and the build is underway. Cool. Uh, we have Rosa. I think she's from Ottawa. Or is, I'm not sure it's a she. It's just Rosa. <laughs> I assumed. Never assume. Uh, Chris Swainston has a question. He asks, um, why would you use different size engines in a cluster? Wouldn't it fly crooked if it had more thrust on one side? Very good question, Chris. We'll answer that here in a minute. Uh, Johan de Sloper, he says, I almost forgot. Hi. Hi, Johan. Alan from Seabrook, Texas is here. He says, for two-stage drag separation is the only way to initiate it is by booster ejection timing, or will Roxham actually simulate real drag separation? All right, that's a really good question, Alan, and we can answer that one, too. So we'll do that one after these other ones. <sighs> Alfred Indy says, where does the software package display the version downloaded and installed? OK, that's an easy one. So I'll answer that one really quick. So Alfred asks, what version do I have installed? Um, you have to go to the About. Um, and they're in different locations on Windows and Mac. On the Mac, it's under the Roxim menu. Um, so you just go to About Roxim. And I think under Windows, it's under the Edit menu. It's either under Edit or Help. Um, and I'm not sure since I'm on the Mac, but on the Mac, you just go to About Roxm, and then you get a pop-up here, and it tells you the version that you're running. Um, I'm running a 10.4, and I know that's it's not the version that everybody else is running because I'm running a, a pre-production version just to make sure everything works. Um, remember how to get to the... Um, version, um, you just come down to your how-to and guys, go to software, and you can go to version history. 
and it will tell you the latest version 10.4.0 so I'm running 10.4.1 everybody else is on 10.4.0 um, so the this the last digit is the bug tells me that there's bug fixes um, and so when it when you go out to 10.4.1 you'll you'll see some bug fixes um, but actually there's a couple of new features so in actuality we should really be going to 10.5 <laughs> um, so I can kind of show you some of the features that are coming um, and uh, they'll come here pretty quick um, let me show you so we'll continue designing we're almost done with the design we just have to add some centering rings and a parachute so I'm gonna add the centering rings to the body tube um, and I highlight the body tube and then I come down here to where centering centering ring button right there click on that again it's looking in the database for centering rings but I'm just gonna click cancel I'll let Roxim calculate the centering rings for me so right now I put one centering ring right there at the front of the tube but we need to move it back um, we also need to give it an inside diameter and a thickness so I'm going to give it a thickness of 0 0.05 inches so this is going to be thin and then the location I'm just going to slide it back and when I slide it back over the engine tube you'll see that the inside diameter changes so basically Roxim is just calculating it for me see that it just jumped to 0.74 it knows that there's a tube right there that it has to account for and that's why I ignore the database because I can just let Roxim calculate centering rings for me um, so this we need to select the material I'm going to select paper so this is a card stock ring um, I'm going to call this the uh, forward centering ring. Let's give it a color. I'm going to change, make it 3D in orange and that color in 2D. Click OK. So now we have one run, centering ring here. And now we need to duplicate it and put another one in the back. So I'm just going to go here, highlight it, and I can go to the edit and do a copy. Um, oops, no, not, not that. <laughs> really delete this component? No, leave it there. I'm going to go copy, and then I want to paste it to the body tube. So I'm going to do, I can either go back up to edit, or I can do a right click with my mouse, and then I get this little menu, and I hit paste. And it pasted it, so i got two forward centering rings. I'm going to edit this other one, just double click on it, and oh I should have moved changed this to the base of the owning part and I'm just gonna move it back about right there and we're gonna call this the aft ring click OK okay so now we have our centering rings um, if you want to add an engine hook um, so the engine hook I'm gonna add to the engine mount tube and you see there's no button called engine hook so we have to add it as a mass object and so I am going to there might be an engine hook in here oh here it is crimped engine hook I'm just trying to adjust this and click OK and so it added the mass object right here and this is one of the new features that will be coming in the next edition when we release it um, you see it has a box around it previously it was just an M in parentheses um, we wanted to make it look more like an object instead of just a nebulous M um, and right now it's showing it as a box but um, I was talking with the programmers this week and I'm gonna make it a circle instead of a box because in 3d it will show it as a sphere so as a mass object so it's kind of 
we want to show it as a physical object in there. Um, and so then the location, I'm just going to slide it back here because that's kind of like the middle where the, the uh, engine hook is going to be. And I'll click OK. Um, now we need a parachute or a streamer um, and a shock cord. So those are going to be added to that body tube. So we'll add the parachute first. So here's the parachute. And we'll add a 15 inch parachute. You can see it's 15 inches right there. And all the, so all I really need to do is adjust the location. So I'm going to go here to the location and just slide it back. And that's kind of where it would normally be stowed in a rocket. And we'll change the color. I don't know what color we'll make it. Orange and, oops, 3D color will also make it orange. Click OK. Okay, so now we have a streamer. We just need a shock cord. And um, so again, the shock cord is going to go to the body tube. We'll add the, there's no shock cord button. So again, we're going to add it as a mass object. And this time we're going to cancel out of the database. And we're going to go to where it says classification. Instead of being a general mass, we're going to say make it a shock cord. Um, and now when I do that, um, I can choose from database. Oops, cancel. Uh, that's the wrong thing. Go to classification. Uh, see, I didn't change it. I was waiting to where the material was. <laughs> I didn't change it. Um, so the material on the shock cord, we're going to call it 100-pound uh, Kevlar because that's typically what I use. And again, it's showing it right there. And we'll move it back. And I use my put my shock cord behind my parachute. Um, and we need to give it a length. And I'm going to make it, I don't know, whatever you feel like. I got 46 inches right now. And the color doesn't really matter, but I'll make it um, darker, that color. <laughs> so that's in 2D. In 3D, it doesn't really, well, it will have a color in the future because it's going to be a sphere. Um, so how did I get there? I went there kind of like this. I need more reddish. I'm trying to match this color up there. Okay, so there's my mass option. So now I got a, a, a complete rocket um, with a um, shot cord, a parachute, engine mount. Let's click OK. I need to save this just in case. So save, and I'll call it, uh, what do we call it? September 30, 2022. Come on. September 30. 30, 20, 22, rocket. Okay, so it's saved. Let's run a simulation. And we've already have the engine there because we loaded it already. The flight events, uh, we have a parachute and it's going to deploy it at the five seconds after engine burnout. Simulation controls, just leave it alone. Starting state. Okay, so right now we're on a 36 inch long launch guide. So that's the rod, it's 36 inches long, and it's aimed straight up. Under launch conditions, our ground altitude is 700 feet above sea level, and we have a six mile an hour wind blowing from the left of the screen towards the right at six miles an hour, and we'll hit a flight profile and see what this looks like. Okay, so we have the rocket right there, and we click the launch button, the rocket takes off. It does a little wiggly wiggly and it kind of straightens out. It is arcing into the wind a little bit, but not too bad. How do we know it's okay? Is we want the apogee point, which is the highest point in the flight, to be in this cone right there. So that's a good flight. Um, the rocket's coming down to the ground and it has a total flight time of just about a minute 
and it landed 292 feet away from the launch pad. And this gives us a summary. Um, our maximum altitude with that rocket was 719 feet right there. And let's look at it in 3D. And there's the rocket in 3D. And it looks orange just like we uh, <laughs> designed it. Oops, I didn't want to print. I wanted to save. Just save it one last time. Okay, so let's get into these other questions. So that was designing a rocket. Your first rocket design, um, it took me longer to talk about it than it actually takes in real life. Once you get to know where the buttons are, you can design this, this rocket probably 10 minutes, probably faster if, you're, if you really know what you're doing. For somebody that's just starting out, um, you do have to learn the names of the parts. Um, and then you have to know the sizes. I see, I know all the sizes. You know, I knew that this rocket that we were kind of modeling uh, is a BT-60 tube. You might not know that, so you might have to do a little bit of research to figure that out um, based on the tubes that you have available. All right, so um, we had a question. Oh, Terry Wheelock says, how can I, how can I rock sim an X24B? Ah, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, technically, Terry, uh, it's going to have to be modeled as a cone-shaped rocket because the X24, for those of you who have never seen an X24, we don't sell it. That's an old Quest kit or an old... Century kit X24 model rocket. Let's see what Google says it looks like. Okay, so we have an image. All right, so this is what the rocket looks like. Um, I don't know if you can see that there. So it, it's kind of um, a triangular cone. This one, they burned off the back. <laughs> this is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like after. Uh, and it had three fins on a cone. Uh, but the cone was triangular. So it wasn't a true circle. It was more of a triangle shape like that. You can't do that in Roxim, but you can do the circle. So you would start out with um, a nose cone and then a transition, and then you could mount your fins on the transition. Um, it would mimic the rocket going up, but once it reaches apogee, um, this is actually supposed to be a glider to glide down. Um, Roxim does not model gliders. So we couldn't see what it looked like in descent, but we could figure out how high it would go. Um, so Terry, that's how I would model an X24 bug. Um, okay, so the next question was, Alan White, um, no. Chris Swainston, he says, why would you use different size engines in a cluster? Would it, wouldn't it fly crooked? Um, so we can take this rocket right here and we can turn it into a cluster. So let's do that. Um, so let me look at it in 2D. Oops, come on. Um, we're going to go to the rocket design components and we're going to go to this engine mount tube right here and we want to double it. Um, and, and Roxim has a really easy way of doing it. And it's just as soon as you select it, you see this button right here called cluster. So we're going to click on cluster and it's going to bring us through a cluster wizard. Um, and so this is the process and you just click the continue button down here. And so it's showing us the back of the rocket and 
now we have a choice of what the configuration is going to look like. I can make it look like that. I could try to wedge three motors in there. If I try to do four, you can see that they're going to hang off the edge. So probably not four. So we can go two. If I want to separate them a little bit, um, let me see. Click continue. Um, no, I can't see all these are grayed out. I can't change it because I chose side by side. So this button says keep them side by side. Um, if I want to separate them, I need to use this button down right here. And then continue. And I can, I can use the cluster radius right here to adjust the size. And if I zoom in, if I'm zooming here in with my, uh, my scroll wheel on my mouse, um, and if I, I can tweak the dimensions here, let's make it 0.26 and hit tab. And it didn't change much. So let's go to 28, hit the tab. It's not changing. Yes, it's just being slow. Um, calculate the maximum radius. Okay, so 0.42. So 0.42 puts them, the tubes at the end on the outside. Um, let's make it 0.35 then. Okay. That yeah, should have worked. <laughs> I want a little gap right there. Eight. There we go. So now I have a little gap. And then continue. And then I can rotate them around. I want them at 90 degrees. So there's my cluster. Continue. You like it. And you can say done. And it put the motors right here. So right now I'm not seeing them. But if I look at the back view, now I can see my clusters. And what we learned last week was that Roxim also changed the centering rings. So if I go to the centering rings, before it only had a single hole in it. Now if I go to it, it shows me two holes. And it's already pre-calculated them, which is like really cool. It just saved us a lot of time because now if I wanted to print out these centering rings so I could cut them out, I could easily do it. Click OK. OK, so now we have a cluster. Let me go in 3D. If, if your rocket is looking like it's a ghost, um, actually, it's, it's highlighted this one ring right here. And you can kind of see the rings right there. Um, if you want to turn it to a solid again, just click off the outside of the rocket, and it should turn into a solid. There we go. Um, but what I wanted to do was look at the back end, and I only got one engine installed, so I got a C6 installed. Um, I'm going to save this. Um, now, what his question was is, wouldn't it go kind of crooked if you put unbalanced thrust on it? And let's we could actually launch it like this. So I'm going to leave. Oh, it put two motors in. Um, I'm going to take this one right here and I'm going to unload it clear. Okay, so we got one motor here on this side, one on that side, and I want to see what this looks like when I launch it. I think this is going to fly straight because Roxim only is a two, a three degree of freedom simulator. Yeah, so it went fairly straight. But in real life, we know it's probably going to go more crooked. Um, so what I want to do is I want to try this in the launch visualizer. Um, because in the launch visualizer, we can, we can get a better um, simulation. So I'm going to open a new Chrome window. And I want to go to rocksim.com. Roxim.com is not Roxim, but it's our launch visualizer. 
and it's going to load here pretty quick. Oh man, we're running way out of time. Um, I'm going to log in, sign in. Um, I'm gonna, then I'm going to upload a new design that I just created. So I'm going to browse my computer for it. It was on the desktop. And there it is, the September 30, 2022 rocket. Click open. And upload. So what it's taking is taking it from my computer and uploading it into the cloud. And now it will redraw the rocket right here. So that's the rocket that we just did. And we want to run the simulation. So I'm going to just leave the launch site alone. Um, starting state. I think we launched straight up. Yep. Um, our weather conditions. We had a steady wind of six miles an hour. So I'm going to go to steady wind. Six miles an hour. Not 60. Click OK. Load an engine. Ah, that should show two must cluster tubes. <laughs> it's only showing one. I can't look at the, let's see if I can. I'm trying to look from the bottom of this rocket to see if there's two motor tubes in there. And I can see two motor tubes. Ah. Why is it not showing my two motor tubes? Here's the S2C6. Five. Click OK. And it loaded it, but it's not displaying it. Click Launch. Let's see what happens. Okay, so now here's the rocket sitting on the pad. And this time I do see one engine hanging out the back there. I'm trying to rotate it. I can't rotate it any further. Not until the rocket gets in the air. But this rocket's only going to be in the air for 2.44 seconds. So let's see what it's going to do. So. This is the launch site in Pueblo, Colorado. Here's the uh, the spectators, and then here's the rocket way out there. Let's zoom in, and let's see, is this rocket going to go unstable? Yeah, sure enough. See what, see, this is what I wanted to see, because this is actually working. The rocket does go unstable because we have off-axis thrust and it arcs over in 2.44 seconds later it's on the ground because it went unstable. Um, it's deploying the parachute because there's a little issue with um, rockets that go unstable. Um, rock, the software doesn't know what to do uh, because the rocket's tumbling um, and it doesn't know when the parachute should come out so it just throws the parachute out at the highest point. But the rocket is, is still tumbling if I zoom in on the rocket, you can see it's tumbling. Yeah. Um, so let me stop it right there. I want to share this. I'm going to share it with you so everybody has it. Um, Where did it go? There it is. It opened up a new. Uh, there it is, right there. It should have put the link right there. There it is. So this link, I'm going to put into the. Um, into the chat. 
so now that simulation that I ran, um, you, if you just click on that, you'll see the exact same thing that I saw. And isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, other questions? Ah. Oh boy, I got a lot of stuff here. And we're already out of time. Okay, so, so we're going to have to take these up next time. So Alan, he wants, um, does RockSim is the only way to simulate drag separation is to initiate it by booster ejection timing or will RockSim actually simulate real drag separation? And the answer, Alan, is you do have to use engine ejection to trigger separation of the rocket because RockSim needs to know when to ignite that upper stage in the rocket. Um, but we can try to show that next time. Um, Carlos says, the cardboard cutout method is a conservative simplification. Is there a conservative simplification for fluid dynamics questions at different air speeds? I'm looking for the optimal tail cone shapes. And the answer is no, Carlos. There is no simplification. <laughs> Uh, for computational fluid dynamics. Um, Johan says, Chris, I build a seven cluster hexagon with one engine in the middle, like lock ultimate theoretically with different engines. I can create my own thrust curves mounting different engines in pairs. And he is right. Um, so as you imagine, you know, one rocket in the middle and then six on the outside. Um, so you can, you, you, you want to keep them balanced so that in case one engine doesn't light, you can still get a straight flight. So um, lock ultimate, this is what it looks like. Um, and if I click here, I'm looking, okay, so here is the back end of the rocket. Um, so it's one engine in the middle and then six around the outside. And so it is possible to fly any one of seven different combinations. Um, if you want one rocket motor, you have to plug all these other ones. Um, two rocket motors, you'd put them on diagonals on the opposite side of the middle. Three, you would just go right across the middle. Um, or you could go three on the, on the corners, more corners on a triangle. Four is like this. Five is like this. Six is all the way on the outside with nothing in the middle. And then seven, of course, is everything filled. Um, so... That was Johan saying, you know, if you want to do motors, you want to balance them. So um, you can do different motors, you know, like this one could be different from this, but these two on the outside, you do want them to be the same. Um, Um, Alfred Indy says, my childhood friend lives and launches rockets in Lakeville, Minnesota area. Cool. Um, Flust writes, unrelated question here. I have an ejection canister for my, do my deployment in my avionics bay. What type of wadding should I use for it? Um, I would use flameproof flame -proof wadding. <laughs> um, is there any other kind? Um, so in flame-proof wadding, the three most common are the Estes wadding, the Quest wadding, or dog barf, which is cellulose household insulation. It's basically old newspapers that have been chopped up and fluffed up, but it has been treated with a flame retardant. So it is flame retardant because it's used in a house. Because if your house catches on fire, you don't want all that paper burning because you because you know how fast paper burns. So, but you the nice thing about it is you can buy a big bale of it at a home improvement store 
for just a few bucks. And so you have a lifetime supply of wadding. And so that's why people like the dog barf insulation. So any of that could be useful for your deployment canisters. Um, Johan says, did you save the design after the cluster, after I created the cluster? And yes, I did. I saw that. Wow, okay. So, and uh, Rick says, another great episode. Thanks, Tim. So, we are over time again. <laughs> so, we'll stop here. So, we will be back again. Um, if you have a question or a comment, you can do that on the video or you can do it by email. Um, if you just go to our website, um, you'll see there's a contact us off on the right sidebar. Uh, if you click on that, that will send us an email. Um, you can't attach anything to it, but you can send an email and then we can reply back. Um, so if you need to contact us, that's the easiest way to do it. So we'll be back again next week. I think that is October 6, 7. Let me look at a calendar here. Um, no, next Friday is the 7th. So October 7th, we will be back right here, same time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States. Um, and then you, if you're somewhere else in the world, um, you can do a conversion and find out when we're live. We like it when you're live because, you know, you're here to have your questions answered. And it's really hard to ask your questions when we're not live. And, and if we're live, then you can see me make a fool out of myself. <laughs> so, um, we'll be live again next week. Let me... Find the end stream button. So in five, four, three, two, one, go out and launch something.